Good day, Glenridge family. It is great to be with you again. A uh, hundred days of lockdown as of today. Mm. We've made a century. We, we are, I trust you are well and you are you're coping and you're allowing God to strengthen you in this time. Please thank you for being connected to us and please do continue to stay connected to us mm. on all our platforms and podcasts and YouTube and Facebook. It is so key in this time that we continue to be connected. And also remember to connect with your friends. Send a voice note, send a message. Um, but as Stan was saying, in, in the description on YouTube and Facebook, you can find the links to all the connection points that you need for Glenridge. So stay with us. We have the amazing Patrick and Shannon and Anna Kenny up doing Shine for us this morning. Hurry up, guys. We've got to be late for church. I hope you don't need you, Dad. It doesn't matter. I don't like being late. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to get my belt on. The belt has got smaller. I don't think the belt's gotten smaller. It has. It, it shrunk. It's Wait. leather, Dad. So what? Did you play with it in the bath? No. Okay, just wait. <gasps> Sorry. This belt is definitely smaller. It's leather. So what if it's leather? It leather doesn't shrink. It doesn't? That's true. My darling, the belt hasn't gotten smaller. You've just gotten bigger. I've gotten bigger? Yes. The belt hasn't got smaller. One word. Pudding. Word for, yes, pudding. <sighs> you see, it's a bit like the belt of truth in Ephesians. So Patrick had changed, but his belt hadn't. And that belt is like God. God's truth, the belt of truth. Now the belt of truth in Ephesians we are told, is part of God's armor that he gives us. And why do you think we have to wear armor? Well, we are told that we need to be prepared because you're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, Faith and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. So you see, the belt of truth is God's word. And what is God's word? God's word is always true. Jesus is God's word. He is the truth, the way, and the life. God is always faithful. He always loves us. He always fights on our behalf. And he's always with us. Those are the truths of who God is. And so when we change on a daily basis, because sometimes we feel really courageous, sometimes we feel really scared, sometimes we're happy, and sometimes we feel quite discouraged. When we have the belt of truth, the truth of who God is, we're able to make it through those times, especially when we're not so Okay. Hello and welcome to Crafting with the Kennys. Today's craft is making a belt of truth. A belt of truth. Now you're going to need a couple of things before we do this craft, guys. The first thing we need is a belt. A belt. A piece of paper. Yes. A pencil. Scissors. Scissors and cellotape. Cellotape. What's going to happen is you take the pencil. And we write down on the piece of paper all the promises of God, like pray every day. Uh, that's my promise. Okay, what is a promise, Smarty? God always looks after you. God always looks after you. Okay, that, I was thinking of that one too, yes. And, and God loves you as well. That's a, so we write down the promises of God and the things about God that never change, okay? Then you cut it out with a pair of scissors. You take the pieces of paper and with sellotape, you stick them to the belt. And hey, Presto, you have a... A belt of truth, excellent, which you can wear around the house all day long. So when the enemy comes and tries to go, ooh, be scared, ooh, people don't love you, and you can go, nonsense, God loves me, you're wearing the belt of truth. Important. Thank you, guys. This has been Crafting with Ken the, Ken the Kennys. Yeah. Thank you so much to the Kenny family. What an incredibly gifted, talented family we have amongst us in our community. More gifted and talented people in our community, Raymond and Kathy Manises, are going to be doing some equipped GC training 
Um, it's going to be for the month of every Tuesday for the month of July. Um, we've set aside our Insta Live, so hopefully you've been following that. Come along with us, and um, we're going to learn about all things supernatural. Thank you, Raymond and Kathy, and invite your friends. Um, organize a watch party together. It's going to be on Facebook Live. Um, Raymond and Kathy are going to be doing some training and giving us all an opportunity to ask questions. So I really think it's going to be an amazing time of equipping for us. So thanks, guys, for doing that, and yeah, spread the word. Wonderful. It's going to be exciting times. We've got to take ground, not hold ground. We've got to keep taking ground in these days. So uh, if you missed the One New Humanity um, webinar that happened this week, it is on our Facebook page, um, as well as on the One New Humanity Facebook page, if you don't yet follow it, um, get onto there and we're just beginning the discussions, continuing the discussions around race and building diverse communities of faith and churches of, of multicultured um, uh, nature. So really uh, it was a great time, I think, and get onto that. Also, there's an opportunity right now for giving. Um, the, the zapper code and the, the bank details are on the screen now. You can also find those details on the website. And uh, so do continue giving. Uh, I've said this before, in times of financial strain, one of the best things that we can do is to open our hands and continue to give and continue to sow. Um, I think there's a spiritual principle in that and what we sow now, we're going to reap later. So I continue to do that. Uh, GC Share continues uh, looking after the people that are not homeless, but actually haven't got jobs at the moment and are battling to feed themselves. Uh, we're up to nearly 90 families that we feed um, ongoingly. So continue to give to that. It is a tax deductible um, thing that you can, if you deposit the money into City Life, and the details will be coming up now. You can also find all those details on the website and trust that you continue to give, friends. We are, we are we're in a moment now where, of faith. And when we started this series around faith, we didn't really know what we were moving into. And what, a, what an opportunity now to trust God for, for breakthrough in finances and employment and all those things. We're but, also giving to Dennis Hurley. We're feeding Dennis Hurley 400 people. We're doing the lunchtime meal on a Tuesday. And next week, we'll bring you some pictures of that. We're using our kitchen, um, which is not at full capacity yet. Mm. So we're taking the opportunity to be part of the churches citywide in the, in, the, in the city. So we're going to be involved in that on a Tuesday, um, feeding 400 people through Dennis Hurley. So we're excited Wonderful. about that yeah, as well. That's great. So friends, um, we have some worship now. Mm. Enjoy, some, enjoy some worship with the team. And let's, let's, let's take this time and just quieten your heart, enter into worship. I don't know what you like, but on a Sunday when we're sitting watching this, um, we're also singing along and, and different. So just and take this moment and enjoy, enjoy some time together as we worship God. Saturday was silent, surely it was true. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment, Sunday's empty tomb. Since when is impossible ever stop you? This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm going to live, going to live again. This is the sound, make the dry bones rattling. Pentecostal fire, stirring something new. You're not going to run out of miracles anytime soon. God is able to say 
and deliver, heal and restore anything that he wants to. Just as the man who was thrown on the bones of Elijah, if there's anything here he can't do, just as the stone that was rolled at the tomb in the
to your people that if we believe you would give us living waters now we receive it's a promise to your people Thank you to our worship team. We did send a message out to all the members of the worship teams, um, the musicians and um, Gary and Paul for everything you do, just to give us an opportunity to come into the presence of God and to fix our eyes on him. When there's so much other noise happening in our lives at this moment, this is such a beautiful opportunity to remind us that actually we need to have our eyes fixed on him. And then I would love to ask you just to stay till after um, Drew's preach because we have some family news that we would like, Glenridge family news that we would like you to listen to. So stay tuned till after the service. Great. Please do stay tuned. It is very important news. Um, Drew is about to preach now, and he's going to be preaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you might be asking, but Stan Cheapers, is that the right thing to be preaching now in the middle of this? Surely we should be, is, it, is that what we should be doing? And I want to say to you, friends, that we are, we're actually in a series on the book of Acts, if you will believe it or not, but we kind of jump around a bit and it's kind of been um, a bit all over the place if you kind of looked at it. But our, our, our trajectory is through the book of Acts. And what we've said is we're going to, we're going to take moments and this, uh, kind of dig down, uh, double click on a couple of things. And we're, we're trying to dig, uh, double click on the Holy Spirit right now. And uh, so Jan spoke on the Holy Spirit and Drew is going to be speaking on the Holy Spirit and Raymond spoke about the Holy Spirit, the, the, the person of the Holy Spirit. Jan spoke about the work of the Holy Spirit. And Drew is now preaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why this is so key, friends, is that, as I said earlier, we're not in a space of holding ground. We're in a space of taking ground. And how much more do we take ground than the use of the gifts that God's given us mm -hmm. to minister to other people? And so really, this is a moment where we want to empower people don't get, we, we don't want to get squashed down and pushed down by the, 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 the darkness and the, the, the trouble that's around us. What we want to do is to find courage in God, find strength in God, stand up and say, God, actually, you know what? We're not, we're, not, we're not stepping back here. We're stepping forward. Father, I want to minister at this time. Mm -hmm. So, Drew, I know it's going to be incredible. Ha, uh, open your hearts and let's, let's listen to what Drew has to say to us and empower us and equip us with. Mm -hmm. Go for it, Drew. Good morning, Glenridge. I am so excited to carry on our series on the Holy Spirit. Today's focus, know and use your spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit gives the body of Christ spiritual gifts for the building up of his church. Now, I have a personal love for this topic because it happens to be the first thing that I ever preached on. Back in Texas when I was a young man, 
in a place called Midlothian, Texas. Small church plant was on, the, on its way, and it's now a thriving church called Harvest Hill Church. And Pastor Nelson Kaufman took a huge risk and invited me to preach. I was 21. And he let me, let me have a go at it. And I have to say that it was absolutely terrible. In fact, it was probably the worst sermon I have ever preached. And I feel so bad when I think about it, all that I put my, those people through. I think it took me an hour to get through everything uh, because I was going through every single spiritual gift and I think about all the pain that I inflicted on those people, and I still feel terrible to this day. But God is good, and he has given me a chance to redeem myself and to preach on it today. And also, I got the opportunity to write a little book about this. God just has a way of taking our weaknesses and turning them into something that he can use. And he did that many years later, and I got to write a spiritual gifts book along with a questionnaire. And that questionnaire is actually now in a, in a digital form and it's free for you to go do and use. And I hope that you can because I want you to know your spiritual gifts. So I encourage you, go to our website. You'll see the address at the bottom of the screen now and take the questionnaire, learn what your spiritual gifts are. Now I'm gonna read from 1 Corinthians 12, one, and then we're gonna go to verse four to 12 and we're gonna jump around a little bit. I'm gonna dip into Romans 12 a little, and then also Ephesians 4. These are the verses where the spiritual gifts are laid out for us. Now, one thing that's worth noting is that all three of these accounts where you see spiritual gifts mentioned link spiritual gifts to love and to the church. We're going to look at that today. 1 Corinthians 12, 1, turn there if you can with me, it says this, now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now jump down with me to verse four. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the Spirit, through the Spirit, the message of knowledge by the means of that same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though it has many parts, they form one body. So it is with Christ. Now let's look down at verses 27 through to the end of the chapter. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles. So he's listing some more gifts now. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then workers of miracles. Also those having gifts of healing. Those able to help others. That's a serving gift. Those with gifts of administration. And those speaking in different kinds of tongues. And those speaking in different, uh, speak in, sorry, kinds of tongues. All are all apostles. Are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you a more excellent way. And he goes on in chapter 13 to talk about love. And we're going to come back to that as well. I want to tell you a modern day parable. Charlie, Charlie needed a bookshelf for his new bachelor's flat. And he looked online for something he could afford. But since he had spent most of his money on a flat screen TV, uh, he decided instead to build his own. So he decides to build his bookshelf. But Charlie had a problem. He didn't have any tools. His dad offered him a table saw and some power tools, but Charlie, he wasn't keen. After all, 
the table saws are, are messy and, and the power tools, they can hurt you and the thought of kind of sawdust and blood on his floor uh, wasn't appealing to him. So he decides he's going to build a bookshelf without any tools. So Jar Charlie bought some bricks, a few planks, and maybe a tub of glue. And he just lazies together and he builds a, a, a shelf. And then he puts it together a little bit more and builds a second shelf. Now by the time he starts to put a third shelf on, he realizes this thing is wobbly. So he wasn't confident to go any higher. So he settles for a two-tiered bookshelf that held, held on by these bricks. And he looks at it, he loads up his books onto it, he admires his creation, he steps back and he thinks, wow, well done, Charlie. This is not looking bad. It wasn't attractive, but he was proud of himself for not making a mess, and he did it all by himself. So he's pretty excited. Now, this is what Charlie's bookshelf looks like. Sadly, Charlie built his bookshelf like many people build the church and kingdom, without the help of their father's tools, given to us by his Holy Spirit. So what are spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts are like God's power tools. And they're good for, and they help us to build his church and extend his kingdom. And my goal today is to help you, is to, to set you on a path, as it were, that will equip you to know and to use your main spiritual gifts. Please do find out what those are. Take the questionnaire on the website so that you can be more equipped and know what they are. We're not gonna have a chance to read and study all of them, but you can click on them and find out about each one of those after you take the questionnaire. So between Romans and 1 Corinthians and Ephesians, Paul specifically mentions 19 spiritual gifts. The whole, the whole list is between those ones, but they can often, I know, and when you read them, seem like they're messy and almost kind of dangerous gifts. I mean, gifts like prophecy and speaking in tongues, they can come across as mysterious or complicated, but there's a reason God created them, and he offers them to us for a reason. He knows that they are exactly what we need to build the kind of church that God wants and that can hold his wisdom and glory, like we see in Ephesians 3.10. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to be eagerly, we have to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. That's what Paul tells us right here in 1 Corinthians 12. He carries on, he mentions it again in 1 Corinthians 14. Each time Paul uses a Greek verb which can be translated as uh, zealously seek out, strive to be zealous. It's a present imperative form which denotes the command to continue to do an action or, and to do it repeatedly. We are to keep on desiring to be zealous for spiritual gifts. This gives a complete opposite picture to the one told in Charlie's scenario. Spiritual gifts are not meant to be an option that we can take or leave as we wish. Unlike Charlie, we're meant to be zealous for the gifts that our Father graciously offers us. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 4, it says, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. What does that mean? Because it begs the question, if we, are, if we all have the same Spirit, do we then all have access to the same gifts? But in Romans 12, 6, if we were to jump over there, you would say, see that it says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So what is it? Do we all have access to all of them or are there specific gifts? Well, because this Holy Spirit is in all of us, all the spiritual gifts are actually available to each one of us. In other words, you have complete access to all the gifts by the Holy Spirit at any given point when you need them. Isn't that amazing? Wow. All the gifts are in your tool belt. For example, you might not feel like you have the gift of healing, but God still wants to use you to pray for healing. And he will empower you with that gift as you need, by his grace, by his Holy Spirit. 
However, it's also true that there will be certain gifts that you operate in more regularly and with a greater kind of ease, as it were. Those gifts are your primary gifts, your main gifts. Have access to all of them, but you'll have primary gifts that the Holy Spirit uses. So when I take the spiritual gifts questionnaire, healing is way down at the bottom of my list. It's not one of my primary gifts. Yet, I pray for healing all the time. When I see a need, when God leads me, I pray. And God uses me and the Holy Spirit uses that gift and it flows through me. I once prayed for a man on the beach and his, he, he, his back was messed up and the very next day he was going in for surgery. And he was completely healed and it was verified by doctors. They went in to do the surgery the next day. They opened up his back only to see that someone had already done the surgery. The doctor's words, not mine. They sewed him up. They told that guy, hey, I'm sorry, we opened your back. You needed the surgery, but someone had already done the surgery. He said, I don't know what happened. That man said, I do. A pastor prayed for me and a miracle happened. He found me, he tracked me down, and he told me that story. But a healing was operating in me in that moment. But it doesn't actually flow readily from me. Other gifts do, like leadership, we all have access to, to, to the Holy Spirit, but there are a few primary ones. Whenever I walk into a room, I naturally can use that gift of leadership so much more readily than healing. You can see where we go, how, what I mean by that. So God wants you to grow in all of them, but he also wants you to know and use the ones that you have specifically designed uh, for you in your makeup. When we do, when we use the spiritual gifts that God gives us, we build something so much better than a small, feeble bookcase like Charlie. So many of us have settled for way too little of what God has for us simply because we do not know what our gifts are and we don't know how to use them. Please, God wants you to use them. Eagerly desire spiritual gifts. It's what Paul, it's what the Bible tells us to do. Second, use your spiritual gifts in love. 1 Corinthians 13 is right after this chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, and it's the famous chapter of love. You've probably heard it read at several weddings. Well, you know, it's actually not written for couples. It's written for the church, for the body of believer. it was believers. It was written with the church in mind, not a marriage. And it comes between chapter 12 and chapter 14 both of which describe how we're meant to use our spiritual gifts. 12, 14, about spiritual gifts. And there's a train of thought from, verse, from chapter 12, 13, 14, all one train of thought that Paul is continuing throughout. In other words, Paul is telling us that to, to be love, love is patient, love is kind, you know these words, not envious, it's not boastful, it's not rude. It's always, it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. We love these words. And the reason Paul put them here is because that's the foundation of how we're meant to serve the church with our spiritual gifts. That's actually the context. Love. You know, I once went through my knee with an angle grinder. You know what an angle grinder is? It cuts metal. Mm just like that. While I was cutting this pipe and then all of a sudden before I knew it, it bounced and whoop, right down into my knee made a huge hole. I could see straight through the bone. It was chaos making through me in the back of the car, blood everywhere. I had to get patched up. I still have the scar. Was it my, was it the tool's fault? No, it was not the angle grinder's fault. It was the user's fault. Sometimes people are scared to use spiritual gifts or they're scared of them because they're used in the wrong way, especially not out of love. That can be said about many gifts that we see used in the church. You know, the gift of leadership has been used for self-advancement at the expense of the church. And we've seen that and people do that all the time. It's actually meant to be used as a service, as from a love. Love is patient, kind, and all those things. Even faith. Faith is one of these spiritual gifts that has been used for people's personal dreams instead of dreaming for the people of God. Have faith for my success. Or the gift of giving. 
has been used for political parties or charities and not to the church. Other gifts like speaking in tongues or healing or prophecy, they have been pushed aside because people are afraid to look weird. They don't understand them. Paul argues that if love is the prevailing motivation behind our actions towards God's people, and if it is the basis of our spiritual gifts, then things would be very, very different. The gifts would be used in the way that they were meant to be used for the glory of God and his bride. Not only would the church grow into all that God intends for her to be, but I believe we would each actually find our personal fulfillment within that greater cause that the Lord is about with the spiritual gifts as we love his bride. Between knowing and using your gifts has to be love. Without love, you will hurt people with the gifts God's given you. You'll hurt yourself. You may even do the very opposite thing that you are meant to do. Love is crucial when we use our gifts. Third, we need to use our spiritual gifts for the church. In, second, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul uses an analogy of the body to show us how we're meant to see ourselves as part of the church. Our spiritual gifts are for the body. Now, there are two mistakes people often make when it comes to using gifts. The first is to use them solely for our own advancement. We're never meant to detach ourselves from God's church or to think of our gifts as God's gifts to us alone for our benefit. They are not simply so we can be fulfilled. They are to build up the body. It's very clear in scripture. You know, as I mentioned earlier in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, Paul outlines the nature of the kind of love we're meant to have for the church and for one another within the church. The entire discourse on love can actually be summed up in one short phrase, and it would be this, love is not self-serving. Again, Paul is telling us that love should compel us to serve each other and use our gifts for the benefit of the church and the wider church, not just for ourselves. Therefore, chapter 14, which is Paul's instructions on the gifts, uh, he, he specifically goes into prophecy and speaking in tongues. And it makes complete sense when we understand that love was the chapter before, because he wants us to use the gift in such a way that grows the church and not ourselves. It's not self-serving. It's not just for ourselves. So he says in verse 12, if you remember, he says, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. So that makes complete sense to us now. We're meant to use in love to build up the church and tongues is a part of that. The second mistake that people use is to use their gifts to extend God's kingdom, but not actually build the body. You know, the kingdom is God's rule and reign everywhere. It's, it's like bringing God's blessing to your workplace. It's the grace that you walk with and you can extend God's kingdom. The church is specifically the body of believers gathered and working together to extend God's kingdom. So I, I see this a lot, actually. Recently, many Christians have seen how spiritual gifts can be used at their workplace or to reach the city or to help the poor but they don't actually use their gifts for the body. Now, there is nothing wrong with using your gifts for the glory of God outside of the church, outside of building the church. And I would argue that that is exactly what God wants you to do. But every time we see the Bible speak about spiritual gifts, we see that they are for the building of the local church, the church, the body of believers, when we neglect the church, we are not using our gifts for their primary purpose. The entire context of Romans 12, where we see a partial list of the gifts, is about community, the whole context of it. It's also a book. The book of Romans was written to a church. This letter was written to a church. 
And furthermore, Paul speaks about the body in verse 5. The context of the spiritual gifts in Romans is all about using them for the local church. In 1 Corinthians 12, the, the, the chapters 12, 13, and 14, clearly written to a church about the church. You cannot say that the kingdom of God was foremost on Paul's mind, the, the, the will and the, the reign of God just throughout. It wasn't his first thing on his mind when he was pinning these verses. No, it was the context of discovering your gifts to use them to build up the body of believers to which you are part. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, he explicitly states, God gives the, gives the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry that it says for building up the body of Christ. Now, some may want to challenge me on this and say, yeah, but I, I use my gifts. I don't actually use them in the church. I use them outside. But Paul clearly states that your spiritual gifts are also meant to be used for the church. First and foremost, start there. Of course, let them be used beyond expanding God's kingdom in so many other ways than just the church. Imagine that someone asked you to build a house. Someone came and said, I want to build, you to build a house. I'm going to give you the materials and the tools and the contacts and the relationships. And you're going to please build this house. I'm setting you up to build it. And then instead of building a house, you build an airport. And you're very impressed. It's an impressive airport. Now, when he comes and asks you about the house you were meant to build for him, you confess that you never built it. And you tell him about this airport. And it's even better than a house. You say, you know what, now you can go places and you can expand your business and you can take it to places that's never been before. And you would say, I did it for you. I did it for you, your kingdom. Aren't you proud? Most likely, you would say, yeah, well, indeed, it's very impressive. But I didn't ask you to build my kingdom. I asked you to build my house. I didn't ask you to build an airport. I asked you to build my house. Of course, God wants us to extend his kingdom. But he loves his bride, and he wants us to start there, and together we can do so much as well. There's a choice before you. You can settle for a two-tiered shelf kind of life. Remember Charlie's, let me put it up on the screen for you again, Charlie's bookshelf. Now I want you to look at some pictures of an actual shelf being built with power tools. Just as they scroll through on the screen. Just look at the detail. Look how amazing these power tools, what they can do, what they can achieve. You can build a life all by yourself without the help of God's power tools, without his spiritual gifts. And it may look impressive to you. It might even impress the world. But in the end, it won't last. And you would have missed the amazing opportunity to be used by God with the gifts that he's given you through his Holy Spirit to build what matters most. Or you can sign up to build what Jesus is building. Part of your assignment this week, look up Matthew 16, 18 to see what Jesus is building. And you can build that with the help of some amazing tools called spiritual gifts. You don't have to be afraid of spiritual gifts. God wants to equip you to build his church. He wants to teach you how to use them. The more you discover your gifts, the more you learn to operate them, and the more you move in them through love, you will find personal fulfillment. And along the way, you will build God's church. Why settle for Charlie's bookcase when you can actually build something more like this? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it's true, that's not that impressive. With the power tools that you had at your disposal, this is all you could do. But don't be fooled. It may look ordinary at first like your life or the lives of most Christians. But there is more than meets the eye. When we discover our gifts and use them God's way, we become doorways between heaven and earth, ushering in the presence of God. 
I pray that you will have that grace and opportunity and blessing from the Lord as you know and use your spiritual gifts. Amen. Thank you, Drew. What a powerful reminder of the incredible spiritual gifts that God has put inside each and every one of us. Friends, Drew mentioned in his preach that he has a, and I'm sure some of you may have done it already, um, he's put together a quiz um, that you can fill in and find out what are those spiritual gifts. Some of you may not know what they are, and we have an amazing online quiz because we're not able to hand out the books to everybody, but head across to the Glenridge website. We'll also be putting it on our WhatsApp groups. Um, just an online quiz that you can do to find out what your spiritual gifts are. It's an amazing tool that you can use in your home groups or in your groups of friends. Use this opportunity to chat through some of the gifts that God has put inside your heart. And um, yeah, we look forward to chatting together a little bit more about those gifts that God has put inside your heart. Wonderful. Remember the outpouring of the Spirit of God on, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost was to empower the church for ministry, was mm -hmm. to empower the church to maturity. And always those two things, maturity and ministry, go together. And this is a moment of equipping for us to minister well to those around us. Remember, the gifts are not just for you, they're actually for the people around you. So I encourage you to get on there and uh, do the quiz and get encouraged about what God has for you. Mm -hmm. We have uh, some family news, as we said earlier. Um, and we're going to cut away to that now. So please don't, please don't go. Um, just enjoy this moment. It is, it is big family news for us. It's going to take a little bit of extra time, but it's worth the wait and worth the, worth the, the watching time. So bless you. Thank you so much for, uh, once again, for being plugged into us. Thank you for what you're doing. Keep ministering. Keep trusting. Keep allowing God to break in. Friends, this is a moment of faith like, never we've, like we've never had before, certainly in my lifetime. And so let's, let's trust God in these days. He's with us. He's right there with us. He's right there next to us. We just need to be aware of Him and trust Him to lead us. So mm. bless you. Stay in tune for the announcement as we go there now. Hi, Glenridge. We have some exciting family news and uh, we are not on the back foot in this time. We really wanted to continue to press forward into what God has for us and what God has been speaking to us about. And one of those moments is now where Drew and Megan are going to give you an announcement or give you some news about something of their future and what God's calling them to. And uh, they're going to give you some of the process. Let me just say to you, we, we spoke to our leaders uh, just before lockdown and told them the news that Megan and Drew and the Land family are going to be relocating back to the United States uh, to take their next steps in God. And so we are this morning with, with uh, even now, it's actually quite emotional when I say this, but we thought that actually we need to be telling the community, we need to put the community into the picture because as a community we send them and as a community we pray for them. Um, so we have a wonderful privilege this morning of Drew and Megan telling you some of their process and us giving you some prayer points to end with. And uh, really exciting. We are sad but excited all in the same moment. So Drew and Megan, we'll leave it over to you to tell the people about how God spoken to you, what God said to you, and, uh, and take us through that journey. We'll hand it over to you. Thank you, guys. Wow, well, we, I brought my colors to show that God has actually spoken to us to go back to our roots, back to the United States. Uh, but it's, it's going back to a United States that we, we don't know as well as we used to. So we've been gone for 23 years. And it was two years ago in 2018 where we felt the Lord say, sell your house. We had a house here in Durban for 13 years. And we felt the Lord say, sell your house. And get ready for the next thing. Now we thought that the next thing might be uh, just moving to another part of Durban. We thought it may be the outskirts of Durban or maybe a, a church plant in South Africa. We weren't sure what that could look like and what was going to be. And then um, we, put, we went on a journey. We, we felt that the, the picture was that the, if we need to loosen our roots and get ready for what God would have for us. And so we went on a journey of just seeking God. What would he say? What did he want from us? 
During that time, especially throughout 2019, we had so many people come to us with prophetic words that God was going to take us to another country. And we had a few, probably about three, saying God's going to take you back to the United States. And we thought, no, I can't. it can't be that. But we were prepared if God wanted to take us to another country. But we didn't uh, have any ideas uh, for a long time, for probably about a year. Uh, we had a leaders weekend then in 2019 here at Glenridge. And I had this picture of, of uh, God kind of shifting some stuff. And then someone else came and gave us, I think, two prophetic words during that time about relocating and again, America. So we thought we better take this seriously. So I came back and I spoke to Megan about it. Um, there was also a moment where the eldership team went away together and Stan brought a, a very powerful prophetic word of a kind of Abrahamic calling on me particularly and, and how God wanted to, uh, like Abraham, I was going to do some uh, significant work. And when I went back from that elders weekend away, I, I felt like part of that word was how Abraham, he went before he knew. So there was a sense of making a step of faith, going before you know exactly where God's going to lead you and what he has for you. So I was sharing that word with Megan. And then that's when uh, Megan started kind of putting some more of the puzzle together. And it started becoming clear that God was talking about America. Yeah, so I think, I mean, for us, just as actually Drew was speaking, I was reminded that this year is a year of faith actually, that God has spoken that, over us right. as a community. Yeah, that's right. I just thought of that now. So these are, these are seasons of faith. And for us, this has been a huge faith journey that God has taken us on. And so when people were telling us, we think maybe America is where you're supposed to go, and we were like, no, no, it's not the right one. Um, when Drew said, just even about being like Abraham, that we, we are obedient, we obey the call, we go, and then God will speak to us. I really felt in my heart, I thought, well, if we, we have to obey this call to go, and it keeps coming, God is so clear, we just don't know where. So I, I was thinking to myself, I said, if we don't know where, then we, we go back to the States at the end of this year, and then we see what God says after that. And yeah, at the end of 2020. So yeah. Megan, this was 2019, this was yeah, the end sorry, of 2019. end of 2019. And Megan said, yeah. if we, we feel, I feel like, if we don't know exactly where, we need to go back to the States at the end of 2020. And when she said that, there was a sense in both of us that we realized yeah. that's not plan B, that's actually plan A. It's not that we have to go to America because we, you know, we don't know where to go. It's actually we need to go to America because that's where we are meant to go. And so when Megan said that, it was a huge <laughs> shift in her thinking because... Uh, yeah, especially Megan uh, did not want to go back to America it was not in our plans we were thinking if we had to go to another country you know let's you know let's go to someplace tropical someplace really <laughs> adventurous Greece, Greece someplace Italy. adventurous um, not back not back to Texas especially <laughs> so that was never in our thinking um, but we felt when Megan spoke it out and said I think at the end of 2020 mm -hmm. if we don't know we need to go back to America we knew that's actually plan God's plan a we then gathered uh, with the Stan and Heather and then the elders and spoke it through. And uh, there was a unanimous sense of God's calling you to go to the States in, at the end of 2020. So then we had another leaders weekend and we spoke to the leaders that uh, God had called us to go to the States. And that was the weekend right before lockdown. So we never had a chance to bring it to the church when we were all gathering together face to face. So this is our opportunity to bring it to you and um, it is still part of a journey it's, it's hard to process these things mm -hmm. whenever you're in lockdown and to try and, yeah. and and think about going to America we don't know what we're going to do yet in America um, there's other people that feel like they do know and we've had some people say I think you're gonna do this we don't want to make too many hard decisions yet because that of that word from the Lord that you're going to be an Abrahamic, this Abrahamic call where when you go, then you'll know. And part of that is because we're not quite sure of the connections he wants to make with us in America yet. And we feel like some of those connections are going to be key to show us what we do next. Do we plant a church? Do we join a church there? You know, what is the next step? There are different kind of options that we could look at, but we're trying not to race too far ahead. We really want this to be a journey where we take one step at, at a time when the Lord shows us. The next step for us is to go to Texas, 
We have our family is all in Dallas, so we will yes. go to Texas um, in December this year. Um, that's our plan. Um, our two oldest will start university next year in America, and uh, we will also learn the culture. You know, we've been gone for 23 years. America has changed. Texas has changed. We need to go back, and we need to go posture ourselves as learners, as those that that are, are figuring out what God's doing. Kind of, you know. Uh, listen to the prophets, hear what the Lord is up to mm -hmm. before we make any concrete decisions. We really feel that that's what the Lord would have us to do. So two things that we need you to pray for us. One is that our youngest son, Keo, he's a South African citizen. He's not yet an American citizen. The other four are. We need to get his uh, United States citizenship uh, dealt with. Um, we're praying for a green card at this moment because of the adoption process that we went through with him. It's it's not uh, the same. It's a little bit complicated to explain now, um, but it's not the same as just a natural born child. He has to get a green card first and then can become an American citizen. And whilst borders are closed, the green card, uh, the people that issue that, the USCIS, which is the American Immigration Office, they're closed at the moment, so there is some prayer, some breakthrough that we need yeah, in that area. Please pray for us. And then pray, secondly, that God would give us the right connections when we get to the Texas, right, make those right connections. And we have a sense that the Lord, just as you come back in, we have a sense that what the Lord has done in our hearts in Glenridge, South Africa as a whole, we've been here for 17 years. We were in the UK for six years before that. But what God has done in our hearts at Glenridge over the last seven years, there's something that he wants us to take back to the States that they need, that we have picked up here. And there's so many things we can list uh, that we've yeah, learned at Glenridge. So many. so many. And we really feel God's going to have us take that back. And uh, Glenridge is going to have uh, 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 an inheritance in America because of the work that he's done in our hearts and because of the partnership that we have together. We're looking forward to that. Yeah. Wonderful. And I think there's, uh, these moments are always difficult because friendships get built. I think Drew and Megan have been in Danish for seven or eight years yeah. now. Seven years. And uh, they have made an incredible impact and made an unbelievable uh, deposit. The value that they've been has been phenomenal. And um, yeah. that, might and be ours. That, that might be our, our son, Keo. <laughs> Come here, my boy. Come here. Oh, Can you say hi to the camera here? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. guys. He needed his sweetie open. So um, we are we we very sad to see the lands go, but very excited about what God is wanting to do. Africa is becoming the source of missionaries to the first world countries. Uh, the tethers are there already. The lands are going to be there now, and it is incredibly exciting, friends. We are not. The, God is on the move. And um, part of the reason why we felt like we needed to say, bring this to you, is that we need to be sending them as a community, not just as an eldership team. They're not going on their own. They're going with us, with our prayer, our intent, our love with them. And uh, so we actually need you to pray. We really, really do. And particularly those two things, connections and, and green cards and immigration uh, status for, for Kaya in particular. So, so really, we would love you to pray and to stand alongside us and we'll have one of our prayer meetings in the near future on a Thursday where we'll actually just get behind the lands and, and begin to pray into being what we feel God is, is saying. But I know Heather wanted to say something. I think, you know, when you look over the massive tapestry of Glenridge Church, um, a beautiful thread that God brought into our community was the land family. And it is difficult at these times. Our children are knitted, our hearts are knitted, and it is a difficult moment for us. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, sometimes when you're so close to the tapestry, you can't see the big picture. And I think this is a moment when actually God wants us to take a step back and look at the big picture and say, actually, this is part of Glenridge's DNA. We send our best to the nations and actually they go to be a blessing. So we are excited and we wanted to bring you in on this journey with us. We wanted you to be part of the process and we are trusting God that we will be able to be together before the lands leave. That is our dream That's and our, our hope dream. and our prayer. Our <laughs> and, um, but, but God, we know that he, is, he, he has the big picture in mind. Yeah. And every now and then we ask him just to show us a little bit of the big picture. 
so that we can actually have courage to take the next steps on together. So right. come along the journey with us. Um, please be praying into those two points that, that they spoke about. And we'll just keep you updated as to the status of, of their next few months as they prepare to cross the seas to go back to their homeland and take us with them. And we can be part of the journey with them. So thank you, friends. Wonderful, guys. I trust you'll be in prayer for us. Lance, thank you again Wonderful. for this. It's been great to get this out in the open. We've been talking yeah. about it for a while now. Yeah. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the morning.